Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 90. As always, my name is Mark, and today I am talking with a couple people. This is actually stitched together recordings from three different interviews I did, and we are talking about the card and dice poll. It is a poll I did with various designers and critics asking them the question, what are the 10 greatest games of all time? 10 greatest board games, that is. And if you haven't read the articles and in, in, in the results of this poll, I highly recommend you do that first over at thethoughtfulgamer.com. The point of this podcast is to ask a couple of the respondents uh, who volunteered to come on what their thought process was for determining their selections, because I think the individual lists are the most fun part. So first person we're going to talk to is Eric Twice, uh, who writes at erictwice.com. His games that he selected, just for context, are Android Netrunner, Chess, Cosmic Encounter, Dune, Civilization, 1830, Diplomacy, Go, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and The Republic of Rome. I hope you enjoy it. All right, I'm here with Eric Twice, who was one of the people who responded to the Card and Dice poll, and I'm here to talk with him about his thought process, how he got his list, and uh, some reactions when I uh, tell him some of the answers. I guess we're going to do some predictions <laughs> first before we get into anything. First of all, thanks for coming on the podcast to discuss this. No, thanks to you, Mark. Like I'm, I'm really flattered you consider me and uh, I'm participating. I want to apologize to all listeners for my Spanish accent. I try to do my best. It's a beautiful accent. I don't know. I no, hope it's no fun. apologies <laughs> needed. No apologies needed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, first of all, tell us a little bit about what you do in the world of board gaming. Okay. Wow. So I actually got into board games, let's say, eight, nine years ago. I was already trying to be a small writer for video games and stuff like that. And one of the things uh, I believe like very, very deeply is that board games and video games and all other sorts of games, to me, they are just games. Uh, I don't really differentiate between both. Like I'm a, I'm a games nerd. Um, I like video games for the same reason I like board games. And so I decided to just start writing about them. And in the last, say, two years or three years, I've been writing pretty much every week. I'm mostly known for my strategy articles. Like... I write reviews from time to time, but people really know me as the terraforming Mars guy, <laughs> which is not the kind of game people really know me for, but it's, it's, it's kind of sucking. But uh, that's more or less it. I, I write strategy guys. I write a bit of analysis, you know, the occasional hot take, as everyone needs in their life. And that's it. That's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome. So tell me about the thought process. So for those who weren't participating, I tried to make the the prompt, the email, very simple, which the question was, what do you think are the 10 greatest board games of all time? And I explicitly say, you can define greatest however you want. I'm not going to dictate what you mean by greatest. So what was your interpretation? How did you define greatest when, when coming up with your list? I think it's, I really like how you... You know, how do you left it open to interpretation? For me, uh, a great game is it's a piece of art. It's something you can look and you can compare to, I don't know, The Beatles, uh, Citizen Kane, uh, 2001, I don't know, I, Claudius, all these kind of stuff. And it doesn't come across as silly. If I compare, you know, many of the games I like, I say, okay, I really like this game, but I must admit it's not great in the artistic sense. So to me, a really great game is a game that shows all the potential of the of the art form uh, to communicate with people, to show something new. And so it's a bit unusual because normally we we approach games in a more okay, let's just have fun sense, which I love, of course, but it's not. I, I like to push more for the artistic side. And also to me, I normally many of the greatest lists are not really games you will actually play. They are very influential games. Like you will include, I don't know, many 40s or 50, games from the 40s, the 50s, uh, many Sid Saxon titles, which were really great, and he's a great designer, but that you wouldn't play today. You wouldn't play Bazaar today, even though it's really influential. So it's more more of a personal, what I think, okay, 
if I'm really going to, you know, to make board games proud and say, okay, this is what board games can achieve on an artistic level, these are the games I- I'm most proud of. <laughs> yeah, so in, in looking at your list, it's definitely of the people that submitted, it, It's there were a number of people who I would say submitted very historic lists. So looking at kind of the history of board games, mm-hmm. some people didn't at all. Yours, I think, leans much more towards the historical side. When deciding that, did you also take into consideration like just how much fun you have playing them today, or were you? Yes. <laughs> was that, is that like a balancing uh, for you? No, no, not at all. Like I know, for example, I have some very old games in that list. I have game from the eighties, game from the nineties, and the thing that they, I just really believe they are some of the best games ever made, and they are some of my favorite games. I know, for example. Uh, one of the games on my list is is Comic Encounter from the 1974. I have another from I have from the 80s, and those are games I I had just discovered today. I'm actually pretty young for board game standards, and these are games I discovered like a couple of years ago, and then I just I was just amazed by them. I said, okay, this is really great stuff. Something pretty interesting is that I've changed how I play games. And the people I play games just so I could enjoy these of the beaten path games. Because, for example, I really love Terraform- Terraforming Mars. You can play Terraforming Mars with anyone. You don't really need anything special. You don't need a large group. You don't need people. Don't even need to be experienced. They, it can be their first game. But some of the games on my list, I recognize that they are very, very demanding. So to me, I was just so impressed by them that. I had to put my effort to play them. So that's, I, I recognize that's a bit unusual. <laughs> no, it makes sense to me. I, I think if, and I think I'll, I'll end up doing this. Oh, well, actually, by the time this podcast is posted, I think I'll have already done it, but I think I'm going to post what, <laughs> what my picks would have been if I had submit, if I had submitted to the contest. And I think my approach would be very similar to yours. I think my approach would be to try to capture Yes, the games I love to play, but it wouldn't it, it wouldn't be exactly my top ten list of like my favorite games. There's there's yeah. got to be some significance to it. Let's talk about a couple of your selections that I find particularly interesting. Okay, starting off the top with Netrunner, which would probably be one of mine. But I know for me, I would I would be like, man, I really you know Netrunner is brilliant. I love it. But should I choose Magic: The Gathering instead? Did you have a similar <laughs> thought process? Because, I mean, they're both Richard yes. Garfield designs. Magic is clearly more influential, if only because it came sooner, but maybe Netrunner is the better design. What 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 thought process went into to that pick? It's a, it's a very good question. I think Richard Garfield is one of my favorite designers. I think he's one of the greatest designers of all time. And I could even think to include like three or four of his games on this list. I will, I will even be tempted to include the Vampire the Star, the Eternal Travel, even though it's a very heavily flawed game. And the reason I didn't include Magic is that I no longer like it. I, to me, Magic has some inherent flaws to it that as much as I love it, I, I no longer truly enjoy playing it. It's, to me, it's too heavily random. There's, you can end up in situations where you are not really playing. Because you don't la- you don't draw enough land, you don't draw enough cards, uh, your opponent is playing combo and you are not. And to me, that's in practice. Like I'm very impressed by Magic. I really love it, but I can't get over that. And it's one of the reasons I prefer far newer games in mm-hmm. in card game terms. And to me, that runner is Garfield best design. It's 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 just something so simple in many ways. You have one action to draw a card, one action to play a card, one action to gain one credit, and then you can spend credits to play cards. It's incredibly simple, and yet it solves is the best economy I have ever seen in a card game. And you mix that with a very this very heavily mathematical economic component of the spending actions with a very psychological and very exciting, which is like you play all the cards face down and you try to, it's an asymmetrical game and it's really thematic and you you try, like the hackers try to capture the agendas inside the deck or the hand or the discard pile and it's, 
it's something very like this combination of like the cold, rational, and the emotional side for me is amazing. Uh, I I was actually a very very heavy player for netrunner. Like I participated in tournaments very very heavily, and you can also see videos of me online, and I'm shaking. Like my hands are shaking, and my and I'm playing, and it's it's incredible. Like very very few games have ever made me feel like that. And I remember one of my very last tournaments which was like the 2018 Netrunner tournament, uh, the Nationals. I had to lie down. I had just won 14 games in a row. I had beaten every single opponent and I was so nervous and so tense. I had to go lie down. And I lay down there for like two hours just to play on the top eight. And I was, I couldn't deal with the psychological aspect. And this is something so incredible. It's like when you watch, like, for example, people crying films, it's pretty, it, it happens. In, it can happen in a board game, but normally you don't cry in a board game. Like the emotional response is not that strong. When I play Netrunner, runner, it's so emotional. It's like, the, to me, that feels like really hard. Like, wow, it's communicating me something so great. And it's also a very personal game because when I sit to play Netrunner runner with other people, I feel what kind of player they are. And you say, oh, you know, I'm playing against this guy. This guy's really baffling, aggressive. And it's, you can see his personality on play. And to me, it's like something really amazing. And it's something, for example, that Magic doesn't have. Magic is a much colder game because the stakes are lower. You can only win 55% of your games. In a runner, you can win every single one of your games. But it's not going to happen because you need to play to such a high level, like you cannot deal with the pressure. And to, to me, it's really one of the most amazing games ever made. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I, completely agree. <laughs> I, leave, I left you like flower <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, yeah, I, I have many. I could, I could sit here and talk about Netrunner for a very long time. <laughs> but I'll just say that I agree. The other game I found interesting on your list is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. And yes. <laughs> a lot of people, I feel like, in the board gamer awareness, it goes in and out of fashion to remember that Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective exists. Yes. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize that it won the spiel. Yeah, yes, yeah, true. It's true. I, it won I, the spiel. I played the game and I didn't know that until many, many years later. Yeah. And it's such an odd title to win. And then yet, it's particular, like there are a lot of games where you do like investigations and even deductions, but nothing really, maybe like the escape room style games feel inspired by Sherlock Holmes. Like it, it was, it was what, the seventies, eighties? I forget. I think it's 1981. Oh, nineties. Okay. Anyways, all that's a long time ago to me. Uh, <laughs> Yes, no, it is to me. It's far it older than I am. it stands alone as its own thing, which I find interesting. Uh, w- w- what's the appeal of that game to you? Why, why does that one make the list? To me, it's uh, it's interesting. It's less. It's one of the lesser inclusions on my list. I actually have to think about it. But when I think about it, it achieves things that are not are very far outside the norm. It's not just a game about deduction or thinking. It's a game about Sherlock Holmes. And it actually does something really, really important, which is that it works and it makes you work and think like Sherlock Holmes. In other words, um, in detective fiction, uh, everyone has, I don't know, their appeal. For example, Poirot. Uh, Poirot is not is very different from CCI or from other detectives because he talks. He talks with people and he tricks them. So what Sherlock Holmes thinks, and Sherlock Holmes, uh, he relies on induction. Induction is not, it's not quite a pure logical thinking. It's, oh, you know, someone murders someone, so there must be a very strong reason for it. You don't normally murder someone for 10 bucks. You know, you normally have to think outside the box. Uh, the best example, actually, in the, in the novels, uh, when when Watson meets Holmes, he gives him his watch. And from the watch, Holmes uh, induces, he doesn't deduce, he induces that he has a brother 
Now, his brother was a drunk, but that he still was, he still did well enough for himself that he could buy the watch back. And Watson gets like really offended at that because you know, this is bullshit. Like you are making this up because you, how could you know this? And Holmes shows it in very basic terms how it was very easy to actually uh, discover this. And I think the game actually, the reception in the board game community is the same. Like people say, oh, this game is bullshit. You know, uh, how could Sherlock know this? The same thing as Sherlock, you know, the designer wrote him to, to solve this case in five clues. And I did it in 25. I, I didn't even know who the murderer was. And I remember like my first game, it was like awful, like really awful. We didn't visit the scene of the crime. And, and then, you know, we saw Holmes and Holmes came with, you know, all his smack face telling us like, oh, this is really simple. <laughs> so when, so at first, like you are very offended by that. And I actually like that because it's captured like that Holmes is a bit of a show off and he's kind of a smack. Like, a Sherlock is not a very nice person and that comes across in the books. And when you play the game and you really start thinking and you start making like drawings and you draw maps and you calculate and I started to realize I was playing like this game was making me get notes and play with four or five people and we were discussing like one clue for one hour and it was so immersive and so powerful and so, so well made that you could do that. Mm -hmm. And and to me, that's really, really unique. Like, there's a lot of games in which you think about hidden information or deduction, but but this game really makes you think uh, like a detective, uh, like a fictional detective at that. And, and to me, that's brilliant. I think something is not an idea you normally see in a, in a board game or any piece of art in that sense. It's very, very new. It has a vision to it. And to me, that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just remember when I played it, the pure novelty of being like, okay, who wants to be the newspaper person who just sits there yes. and reads the <laughs> newspaper <laughs> and tries to cross-reference everything to what's happening in the newspaper? Uh, there's no other game that has that. That's for sure. Yes. Um, let's let's. I'm curious. You said you wanted to try to make some predictions. So we're recording yes. this before I post the list publicly, right before I post the list publicly. Um, and I'm curious uh, what your predictions are. I'm going to make one one okay. prediction, which is that Go is going to be on the list, but Chess is not going to. So kind of right. Kind of ah. right. So <laughs> again, I didn't get as many responses as I wanted. So there's... I will say there there are three games that got four mentions, and those are the top three. Um, mm -hmm. There are, let me count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that got three mentions. Oh, that makes a clean top ten. I didn't realize that. So, yeah, there's, the, there's your top ten, I guess. So, yeah, Go is one of the top three. However, Chess is one of the top ten. Oh, it is in the top ten. Yeah, nice. They both were mentioned. Okay, so... Uh the, the reason for that is that I think people, like, I, I really believe chess is, is, is an amazing game. It's, I, I think it's one of the, you know, it's, I, I think it's better than anything Beethoven ever made, for example. So it, for, it's, it's that huge. I, I think it, it's probably one of the most important games ever made in, in the history of mankind, not just in the history of games or the most influential. And, and Go, Go is, far less influential, of course, but it's also an amazing game. When you play them, you say, okay, this is really achieving something unique. But, you know, to us in the Western Hemisphere, like chess comes across as this, you know, a Star Wars of people, oh, why don't you just play chess? Like your, your grandpa played chess, you can go to the park and there will be people playing chess and they don't even know Catan, you know, can't you believe that, you know? So it's. I think there's a bit of, re, of a reaction against chess in, in board game circles. And people say, oh, you know, it's overstudied and it has openings and I don't like it. So that's why I thought people wouldn't, wouldn't classify chess that high. 
And I can see people debating or chess or Go is better because they are very different games. Go is one of the most elegant games ever made. And chess, chess actually has like this deep history and all these different name strategies. It's, you know, one is pure elegance, the other is par. It has more flavor, more difference in play. So it's kind of, they are very different, but though they, they are abstracts. And to me, they are both great. I, I think there are games that if you, if you really enjoy games, I, I can really not understand not liking those games. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm terrible at both of them. Like, I've literally <laughs> never won a game of Go. And it's not like I've been playing experienced <laughs> players. Like, I started playing with a group of friends, and we all kind of learned at the same time. And I still never won a game. Uh, but it's it's remarkable. That game's really something special. I think Go came out ahead, you know, it's by one selection, but I think Go came out ahead because I think for the people who included either game, they probably don't play either of them that much. And I feel like then it comes down to which one do you respect more? And right, Go is, you know, is mathematically more, more complex. I think it's a lot more elegant. So I I don't know. I think that's why... I think that's why it got the edge there. Yeah, yeah. You could argue that there are a couple hidden rules in Go, but how many rules are even there in Go? Three? Right. I mean, yeah. uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's very hard to think of a more elegant game than Go, and it's one of the most of the deepest games ever made. Mm-hmm. And, and you can, like, chess is really, really elegant, but it has eight different types of pieces and it has a couple of strange rules like a uh, castling and impassant. Mm-hmm. There's people that don't 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 even know that impassant exists and they think they are you are cheating when you when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to to happen in Go. In Go you just play and you don't understand anything. As it's like this game has three rules and I'm losing and I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Any other predictions you want to try to make? I I have like this suspicion that Gloomhaven is in the list and it's going to be like my the biggest disagreement I have. Gloomhaven is in the top ten, yeah. It is on the top ten. Yeah. I also think Catan is not on the list. It could be if people think about the influence, but I don't think it it, it is. I don't even know if Catan was mentioned at all. I don't think Catan got one like, mention. One mention. Only one. I don't think I th- I also think that Nisia might be might be on the list with at least two games. Who? Oh, Kinesia. Uh, Rainer and Kinesia. Yeah. This is this is my biggest surprise. No Kinesia game made the top ten. Wow, that's that's actually surprising. Even though I I contributed to it, I am absolutely surprised by the game that got the most votes from him, which is one of his newest games, Babylonia. Babylonia. Oh, interesting. I, I can see that. I haven't played it, but I can see that. It is very good. It's, I one of the reasons, like for example, the uh, Tigris and Euphrates is not on my list, is that I haven't played it enough. Now, like there are several games you could make an argument for that I, I didn't include on my list because I just haven't played them twenty times. So I, I don't Euphrates feel thing? Tigris yeah. and Euphrates didn't get a single mention. Wow. Three wow, well, I, I really thought it was like the most well respected of his games, like I the most too. serious. Now, to be wow. fair, I haven't played it, so I'm certainly contributing to the problem there. <laughs> so yeah, the only three Canadian games that made that were mentioned at all were Babylonia, uh, Lost Cities, and Modern Art. They are more. I think also people like really respect Nisia, especially designers. Because his games are very simple, very familiar in a sense. And that's very difficult to do. Like, for example, take Richard Garfield. Richard Garfield, people may be jealous of him for all his complex games. But to to him, like, the biggest achievement is a traditional card game. And that's something that designers, like, designers see a traditional card game, like a new twist, and they... They think it's like the peak of the art form, which is very different from us critics who tend to prefer more gamey, complex games. <laughs> mm-hmm. You want to hear the other two in the top three or, or try to guess? Yes. 
And the top three, actually, the thing is that I'm not sure because I feel I'm very out of touch with you, with gamers sometimes. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a hint. You, one of them ha- has been mentioned before in this discussion. It's Cosmic Encounter. Nope. Cosmic Encounter is not there, Philistines. I can't believe this. <laughs> it uh, Cosmic got two mentions. Two mentions. Sally's another person with common sense on this list. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually surprised me. I thought it'd be high up there. It's it's interesting. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, to me, Cosmic Encounter, it's... Like, when I first played... Here's the thing. When I first played game, Cosmic Encounter, I thought it was a good game, but I wasn't interested in it, and I didn't play it for years. And I didn't care for it. And I thought it was a good game. I just wasn't impressed by it. And it took me a while, and when I started playing it again, uh, it quickly I quickly realized it was one of the best games ever made. It's First, it's the most fun game I've ever played. It's just fun. And this is something like, oh, you know, this game is very thinking. Like, in Cosmic Encounter, I laugh. You can take the power of winning that you are losing, and people have to help you win, or... Or they also lose too. It's like you can take the role of another player in this game. Uh, one of my favorite Italians has the power to make newbie mistakes, and you can turn it to like an annoying newbie that has never played before. And you can make like little questions like, is this card any good? And the others don't have to answer, but you can just ask them. And this is like so fun. It's game breaking fun in a way that it, it just brings me joy. I don't know, that's something so, so difficult to find. Like, in, For example, in movies, like comedy tends to fare very poorly. Uh, film critics don't, don't tend to like comedy. Uh, Cosmic Encounter is comedy. It's, it's so fun. Like, or it has bluffing. It has negotiation. It has new situations. It has all sorts of small, soft skills. You can win games by hand management. You can win them by bluffing. You can win them because you convince the whole table to gang on one play and one player. I've lost that game because five people won and I was the one who lost. Yeah, yeah. And that's for for me. If you, I think that's that's kind of the thing with my list. Like many of these games, that you, you think it's like this is so out of bounds. This is something I didn't know games could do. Like you could create a game in which the whole table could win and one pay- player could lose. And also, I, I realize it's it's a deeply, deeply, deeply science fiction game, and it's I think it ranks amongst some of the best science fiction I've seen or played or read. And the reason is that science fiction as a genre has like one big question, which is like, what will happen if this happened? You know, uh, what could happen, you know, what happened if we ha- could travel through time? What could happen if uh, we could colonize other planets? And Cosmic Encounter has a lot of stuff like that. Like, you know, if you had the power to give people gifts, how could you take over the galaxy? And the fact is, this is an, an alien called Philanthropist. And it's a really, really, really strong alien. It's actually in the top 20 or, or something of strongest aliens in the game. Right? His power is given. And the idea that you could create a game in which giving is a game-breaking power and it's one of the most powerful things that you can do, that's, that's to me, it's amazing. It's, it's like I actually wrote like 2,000 two words on on this alien, and I could write far, far more about it. And I mean, it's very revelatory of uh, of people, you know. As what, what what are people like, you know? It's it's a, a small aspect of humanity in that, and I think that it just goes beyond what you know. Uh, for example, a, a worker placement game. I, I like some worker placement games. It's not my favorite mechanic, but. When you play that game, it's okay. I'm playing. I'm being efficient with my moves. I'm trying to, you know, change my moves. I'm thinking about them, but they are very, very consist very small games. While Cosmic Encounter, many of the games on this list, they are like very broad. They make you think, 
about you know society and people and other players and stuff like that and and to me that's really really amazing and also cosmic encounter is it's probably the oldest game in in my list and in everyone's list it's 46 years old i think you know, outside, and, of, outside of go and chess, yeah, yeah yeah outside of chess and go like it's the oldest modern design so to speak mm-hmm. and no, i was just thinking like the, the fact that it's resonating with people over and over is because it communicates with something very basic on, on ourselves and very very human, and I, I really like that. I, I love your comparison of Cosmic Encounter to comedies and how comedies don't typically do well among the critics, which is a really interesting... I just wanted to highlight that. I don't know what else... I don't have anything to add to that thought, but I think that's very interesting both in thinking about film and in thinking about board games of what are the board game comedies. Yeah, looking at the top 10 consensus list i mean there aren't really i mean there's there's moments of levity in almost every game but yeah a lot of these games are pretty kind of serious games which are great i love serious games but yeah that, that's i got i gotta think about that one some more <laughs> yeah like uh, actually for example uh, designers when designers are testing a game like having people laugh is one of the best indicators you can have in a game that people are enjoying it Mm-hmm. And also something very important, Cosmic Encounter is silly, it's very fun, but it's also a deep game. And it also has a strategy to it, and it also has, it's not just, okay, I'm going to play this party game for 15 minutes, and that's it. I really believe it's it's unmatched in how many soft skills it requires. Like, it's a negotiation game, yeah, but it's, you don't win just by negotiation. It, it has bluffing, yeah, but you don't win by bluffing. It's got, it makes you think outside the box. So the reason I really love that game is because it's so noble. It makes me think in so many ways. And out of this infinite ra- array of options, how can I how can I win? And how can I connect with other players? And, you know, when you see people and you say, okay, I have to fight with the pacifists. And the pacifist, if I hit him, I lose. <laughs> you know, it's like how, how do you, how did you beat that? It's it's so very very compelling, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you sure. can't even take it to, you know, you can uh, stroke your chin and say, oh, you know, this is like uh, the Indian Revolution in the 1948, and it, it kind of is. You can make that comparison, but it's in a very silly comedic way, and. To me, it's huge. It's, it's really, really important to me. And I think it's undervalued. In general, I think, especially in, in the current state of board games where the most popular games are Euro games, we tend to be more thinky and more colder, so to speak. So I think we sometimes forget about this, you know, something like that you laugh. And laughing is very important. It's very, very difficult to achieve. I think it's one of the most, like, we go to film. A good comedy is very difficult. Like most, yeah. if you fail at comedy, you probably create one of the worst films you can imagine. It's very painful to see a very bad comedy. You can watch a bad action movie and have fun. You cannot have, you know, if you watch a Zack Snyder comedy, is going to be very painful. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. It goes back to my wife and I uh, deciding, trying to figure out what movie to watch. Like, let's watch a movie. And she's like, I, w- I want something lighthearted. I'm like, we've seen all of them, <laughs> all the ones that I care to watch. Like, you know, you often want to f- watch a good comedy, but man, it's, it's hard to find one. It's really hard to find it, one. It is. Um, it is. It really is. In, in, yeah. in terms of it, it, just thinking about film, the crazy thing is in terms of like critical acceptance and popularity, the most critically acclaimed comedies are almost all silent era. Uh, which is interesting. Yes, you have the Silent Era. You have uh, I don't know what's the title in English. Uh, Someone like them hot or something like that. The Marilyn oh, Monroe yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, you have that. And but the next one, which is, is this is a Spinal Tap, perhaps. Uh, I think maybe, that's the. But Fargo's dark. Like it's a. Yeah, Far- Fargo is. Not <laughs> it's really dark though. You, uh, you have a guy throwing through a wood chipper on that film, and it's. It's actually very funny in, in context. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. All right. You want to hear the, the final two? We, we Go is in the top three. Do you want to hear the other two? Yes. All right. We've got uh, Terraforming Mars. Wow. 
He didn't expect that one. And then another 2016 release, Scythe. Scythe, wow. Yeah. Really didn't expect me. that one either. Yeah, I think that one will generate a lot of discussion. I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of strong opinions about Scythe <laughs> <laughs> out there. And I'm curious how, how people react to it. Well, it, it's funny. I, I really like, like, people know me as the Terraforming Mars guy. I played hundreds of games of it, but I don't actually think it's a great game. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it because of the game it is, but it is it is an engine builder game, and uh, like all the criticism you can make of an average engine builder game that you know low interaction, uh, all your actions are very similar. It, they, they are true. I just really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's got like I don't love terraforming Mars. I actually wrote a piece about why I I don't really love terraforming <laughs> Mars, but I can I can see what draws people in so much, like. It, it it is always fun to like build your own thing, right? That yes, that draw that like pure Euro game draw of like this is my thing that I constructed and it's generating you know large outputs. That's just yeah. inherent. And I'm making really. money and I'm going to spend this money on a comet and and then when this goes blow down, I'm going to build a city and and yeah, like a, for example, it's. I would rank like I don't know Dominion to me is uh, probably the best game in this engine builder genre, and I wouldn't put Dominion on this list. So I, I expected one, one one game like that to make it on the list. I, I wouldn't expect Terraforming Mars would be it, and and a site I don't like a site. <laughs> I think to me it's the do you know in video games people complain about uh, chess high walls. Which is, oh, you have this world and you want to explore, but there's this, this fence and you can't climb over the fence because the game designer is like, no, 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 please. That's, that's dangerous. You have to follow this path. And that's the way I feel about the site. Like all the sighting things, pun intended, uh, I can do them. It's like, oh, I, I'm going to kill your workers. No, no, please, please. That's, that's too rough for us that you can, you are going to lose popularity, you know, because when I think Eastern Europe, I think of losing popularity. When you have the Canate of, you have Russia and you have all these uh, countries that have been very violent against each other. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, in, in the end, it's the opposite. It's a very calm game. And please, gentlemen, no war, you know, don't, don't fight in the war room. And I also think it has stuff like, I don't like it. You know, it has very heavy balance problems. That people have addressed, like the Russovets are too strong if you pay them with the industrialist. But I just don't like that at his core is like all the cool ideas he has, I don't think it delivers any of them. <laughs> yeah, Scythe is a really interesting it's a really interesting case in that I completely agree with you that what it presents to you initially is not what the game is at all. Like, the game is not what it looks like it is. But I still like it. And I feel like I'm in, like, the middle of this war where everyone's, like, the people love and the people hate it, it are, like, on it. either side of me. And I'm like, yeah, it's an enjoyable game. <laughs> I don't think it's special, but uh, I find it enjoyable. No, it is It, it is an Euro game. It is an Euro game, and it is, like, all, the, all other Aztec major games, it's, it, it's made so it's pleasant to play. Mm-hmm. Which is actually the the complete opposite of my list. Like my whole list is made of games that are mean, evil, oh, it's that true, you are going yeah. to go back crying. Like it has diplomacy on it, which is the most evil game I've ever played. It has the Republic of Rome. It has Dune. So it, it has a lot of games. XX. That, yeah. It has a thin XX. It has like the like in the top five most Machiavellian games I've ever played. That like four of those games are on this list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's something that like, is very shocking about, like, about my opinions on the subject. Because normally people like people just want to have fun, and I'm I'm kind of a tryhard in the sense that when I play, I really want to play like the best game I can, and I want to put all the effort in playing the best game. And if I have to cry and I have to read a manual, if I have to, you know, manage my emotions so i can feel them and to me that's a big plus like uh, for example diplomacy is on my list you can break up a friendship like a real friendship 
through diplomacy. Like you can have a row with your friends when playing di diplomacy. And people may see that as a negative, but I see it that way. You pay a piece of art that is so strong and so well made and so emotionally powerful that it can cause you to have a row with your friends. And that's, that to me is, to me that is uh, amazing. Like it's, it's terrible in the, in the artistic sense of the word. Like when you see, like, you know, you see, uh, I don't know, for example, you see, you watch, Seven Private Ryan, and you have this opening a scene, and it's hyper violent, and you, you are on your seat grabbing. And I feel like that's playing diplomacy. Diplomacy is very, very emotionally driven. And even myself, I, I had problems with that. And I said, "Wow, I, I'm getting too much into it." <laughs> <laughs> and because to me, like people think, for example, pe when people think of the worst game ever made, they think of something that is very well, very poorly designed. Or, or, you know, like they think of, I don't know, Monopoly or Munchkin or I think people are unfair on Munchkin, but it's not a great game. And to me, the worst kind of game is just bland. It's the game I don't care about. So for me, many of the games on my list are games that strike a very strong feelings on me that I can see and think, wow, I think this is this is powerful. Because at the end of the day, there are hundreds or hundreds and hundreds of games if you make, uh, and they are kind of my punching bag, you know, if you make yet another worker placement game uh, which takes place in Mediterranean Europe, it, it may be very well made, it might be deep, it may be interesting, but I won't find a very strong need to play them. While you can, one of these games, you tell me, you know, like Doom. <clears throat> in Doom, you have one of the, the factions at the start of the game they list another one player and one turn. And if that player wins on that turn, instead of them winning, you win. And it's the most brutal, uh, emotional, and downright fantastic mechanics I've ever seen in a game. That has happened to me. We were in a game, and it was like, wow, this is awesome. We just won this game. Six players, I won. We were totally, I, I was one of the losers. I go, wow, this is... They just cross us, and suddenly the, the guy comes around and says, I predicted this four hours ago. I predicted this victory, and now I am the winner. And it's like, it blows your mind. It blows your mind at so many levels. And it's, I think it's better than the novel, and it's better. I haven't seen the new film, but it's better than the old film. Because it's one thing to make, oh, you know, I'm going to make a, a prophecy, and it's going to come true. Well, yeah, but you know, you have the writer telling you to how to do it. So it's easy. It's easy to do it when, when you, you know, the writer favors you. It's the reason Batman always wins, you right. know, because <laughs> he's the favorite of the writer. So, but in this game, it's not true. Like the, it can fail and it actually doesn't come into play that often. But it's like, wow, you made a game in which you can make a prophecy. And you can work to make that prophecy true. It's again, it's mean, mind blowing. It's uh, to me, it's just incredible. It's it's a concept that is. I think even if you don't like the game, and there's many people who, I, I'm sorry, they don't like the game because they hate fun or something. But I think <laughs> even they, even they see that and say, "Wow, okay, I respect that." <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a good, that's a good summation of your list. Like you, you have a lot of very powerful, dramatic games on there. Um, yes, that's great. And uh, like I've I've mentioned multiple times, like the whole point of this isn't necessarily like I think the aggregated list is is the least important part. I think yes, seeing how everyone individually approaches the question is is the most exciting part of this project. And I I do really find your list fascinating thank you so much for participating and in talking about it I well for real I, I like like i'm like really I, i'm so flattered you know the guy who is wrong all the time people say oh you know i find your opinion interesting i don't agree with it but i do find it very interesting and to me that's that's the biggest phrase i can get as a critic <laughs> Next up, I talked to Ryan Laflamme, who writes for the Cardboard Republic, which is just CardboardRepublic.com. His selections were 1830, Agricola, Arkham Horror, 
Catan, Chess, Hero Quest, Magic the Gathering, Monopoly, Triumph, and Werewolf. How did you approach the question of what are the 10 greatest board games? So I actually jumped around on this a few different ways uh, originally because I, you know, it's such an open ended question. And that's part of what made it so fascinating to me is how each person would approach and, and contribute their ideas of what that would mean. And I, I was originally kind of drawn to the idea of, of titles that were either really runaway successes or titles that were kind of the groundbreakers of, of the specific mechanics or specific genres. And I ended up doing this huge deep dive of like, we, what titles I thought would, would kind of encapsulate the, the 10 you know, best, I guess, mechanical innovations for, for board gaming. And then um, that quickly ballooned into just an untenable list that said, okay, this is, this is way too much. So I kind of scrapped that and I, I, I refocused my approach onto titles that, in the same vein, titles that may have had innovation to them, um, but weren't necessarily, they didn't have to be the progenitors. Instead, it was it was kind of titles that led to massive leap forwards in, in making progress in the hobby in terms of uh, appreciation, in terms of exposure, in terms of growing and evolving the hobby, um, either through um, reaching new audiences or through innovation. That was definitely part of it. Um, and, and as well as, in turn, inspiring other games and, and titles and genres to come after it. And that's how I kind of honed in on the, the, the list that I ended up settling on, which from afar does seem a little eclectic, I know, but I think that that stands up pretty well, at least in my mind. Yeah, and I think you see that on the list because I think there's there's a certain scale you could measure people's lists on of like what is historically significant and on the, on the other side of that scale, what are my favorite games to play right now? And yours seems pretty far on the side of historical significance. How much did like your personal enjoyment of the games factor into the decision making? So indirectly, it, it still did, um, because when I was thinking about kind of how to, you know, to take a second stab at it, really, one of the things that I sat down and thought about was, well, I was really into games as a kid, into board games, as a lot of little, as a lot of kids are, and not just necessarily to the the, the classical kids games. I, I had older brothers, so I was kind of exposed to um, some kind of non-standard uh, board games at the time. Uh, and then I was, you know, I refound uh, my passion for the hobby, uh, you know, once I hit kind of uh, high school and college age, and it's never really never looked back since. And I was thinking about particularly that both the period when I was little, little but also that period when I got back into the in, into board gaming, uh, into board gaming, uh, which had to have been, you know, probably the late 90s, early 2000s. And what it was about the games at that time that really caught my attention and what really made me passionate about getting back into a hobby that I'd really loved when I was younger, uh, but had drifted away from because of the advent of, you know, things like video games. And so it definitely had a, a they definitely, definitely played a factor in terms of my own personal enjoyment, but, it, you know, it wasn't, I didn't think that just me stating my, my personal favorites were necessarily um, indicative of what I thought like the greatest games of all time were. And I tried to also kind of not make it just strictly just a historical thing. Cause there's definitely, um, if I was going to do that and I was going to really be impartial to just the idea of a uh, historically significant, uh, significant games, I don't think there'd be a game past like 1950 in there. Um, when you really mm -hmm. get down to it, um, there's a lot of really famous, um, classical games that have been around for centuries and we wouldn't have a hobby without them. Um, and you could just do a whole thing on just, you know, 10 of those. For sure. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about a couple of your individual selections. So the one that really st stood out to me when I was looking through the list that I had never heard of before uh, is Triumph. Triumph? I don't know how to pronounce Triumph, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Triumph. Yeah. It's, it's, it's French for Triumph. <laughs> sure. I figured. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever in that. Triumph is basically the progenitor of all trick-taking games. 
And it is in it itself is actually not necessarily the first one. Um, and without going to this whole thing, but uh, it, for people who like kind of the history of trick taking games, it's um, it's it's centuries old. Trick takers are, are very old. They're some of the first things that people did with card games, you know, going all the way back to to you know, a couple of millennia ago or millennia and a half ago in China, filtering its way through you know, through uh, Eastern and then Western Europe and, and so on. So it's it's a fascinating history in and to itself. But Triumph is itself kind of a spinoff of a an Italian game with a very similar name that was played with with uh, with tarot cards. And this this was kind of a scaled down version of that that could use what we consider a normal bicycle deck of cards that didn't have to have a fancy t- uh, tarot deck. And that is what really caught on with people. And then it ended up just creating all these sorts of variants and, and, and spinoffs and, and um, adaptations as it spread, particularly through Europe in the, you know, from the 1500s on. Um, but that was really kind of from there, from Triumph, it kind of split off into the two kind of parent branches of, of trick takers, either uh, what eventually becomes Euchre or what eventually becomes Whist, which in, in turn is pretty much all where almost all modern board game uh, trick takers are, are based off of. So it's, 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 it's really the one that kind of, in my mind, at least really was a catalyst for, for bringing trick takers as we think of them into, into kind of provenance and has been, and just continued to evolve for, for centuries. Um, and as we all know, like trick takers are not just in and of themselves, an important part of, of board gaming, but they, but they in turn has definitely inspired a whole bunch of other things that you can do with cards, multi, you know, multi-use cards and, and, and all these different, you know, adaptations that have come out of what they do. So it's, it's kind of fascinating and all that. And I, I thought that was kind of the, to me, a turning point in the evolution of, of particularly of card games as we think of them. That's it's so interesting. That that is a bit of game history I had no idea about. How how does it play? Because I always think of like the simplest trick taker in my mind is hearts. That's like maybe that's just because that's the one I first learned. But that's fairly simple in terms of trick taking games. Is Triumph even more fundamental and basic than that? Or yeah, I mean, the, yeah, basically the the kind of the hook to to triumph as a, as a, when we're split off from, from, and I, I can't quite remember the Italian, I think it was Triomphi, I think that was, was that in, in Triomphi, it, there's a fifth suit that is all, you always have a dedicated trump card, a uh, trump suit. Whereas in uh, Triomphe, it was the first real iteration of a variable trump suit. And so that's where everything kind of splits off from there. And like I said, it kind of ends up, you end up going down like the Euchre route, or you tend to go into, into what ultimately becomes Whist. And then um, most of what we think of uh, as, as modern trick takers are kind of off of the Whist line. Yeah, and Whist is actually uh, a selection someone else chose, which I found interesting. I believe, I don't know if there were other trick taking games mentioned, but if there were, I think all of them were quite old. Uh, people gravitated towards the kind of originals there uh, which is interesting let's move up to i believe the newest game on your list uh which is agricola i'm curious uh with all of these games that you know as you said they were kind of like turning points or started something agricola was as far as i understand one of the first worker placement games but i believe Kalis is considered the start of worker placement right Alice was probably the first wide scale worker placement game, if, if memory serves. I think the the claim to fame, I believe, is actually Keydom, um, which is the one. It was oh, the really? first was one of the first key games, but it was um, as was as the case with the first couple of key games. It was a very very uh, limited run. They were handmade with only a couple hundred copies that ever existed, and so it kind of like made its mark there as kind of the proto worker placement games. And, and I believe um, he still um, likes to stake that claim that he invented worker placement, but it Kalos was, was the first that kind of made that 
available to a widespread audience. But even then, and Kalis is nothing wrong with Kalis. I like Kalis. But Kalis, in turn, pales in comparison to the explosion in worker placement uh, fanfare with Agricola. Agricola was really the first one, at least in my mind, that took the idea of worker placement into what I guess we'd call mainstream hobby gamers. Um, it was incredibly popular. It was it was ubiquitous for gaming of that of, of several for, for years, really. If you it was a you know if you had if you picked it up in what was it late 2000s, it was like 2007, 2008, you know, if you had picked it up then that was a brand new thing and it was really fascinating and it was a whole new way of of playing with this worker placement idea spawned all sorts of kind of imitators and and um and and uh, descendants from there and yet with all the what, hundreds of worker placements that have come out since you can still sit down and play agricola it still has that gravitas to it in the same way that that, that you know Kalis does to a lesser extent that it still holds up and to me, that was really a turning point in uh, kind of that that n next wave of board game evolution that you kind of saw from 2006, 2007 through around 2012, where you really, it was just this leap forward in game design. And Agricola, with, alongside a few others, was really kind of at the forefront of that. And then finally, you were one of two people to include Monopoly. Uh, only which, two. <laughs> which only two of the 18 included Monopoly, which low key in my mind was the most one of the more interesting uh, questions when I was making this is like, what do you do with Monopoly? Because I'm not going to assume presume whether or not you enjoy playing it. But for most gamers, I think they do not enjoy playing it. And yet it's undoubtedly incredibly influential. Uh, and important in the history of board gaming. What what was your thought process in including Monopoly? Well, exactly right. Um, in some way, shape, or form, most people who are into board gaming today uh, would not be here without Monopoly. I, you know, it's it's a it's a, one of those facts that we kind of try to eschew and we try to to kind of look the other way about. But it's true. It's you know, in the same way that when when we were in the same way that you have these other kids games that we grew up with that we think of, you know, Candyland and Shoots and Ladders and, um, and and others that that we kind of were exposed to and made us first aware of what a board game was. Monopoly was undoubtedly in that equation. It was it was a mainstay of 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 kind of recreational. Uh, activity, particularly for children in the 20th century. It is one of the best-selling games of all time, if not the best-selling game of all time, because it's been around for almost a century. It's in almost every language you can think of. It has an insane amount of spin-offs and licenses and IPs and all that stuff. And people still play it. Now, I agree with you that like, by a, by a modern perspective of 80 years of game evolution, is it objectively a, you know, does it hold up to, to the, the demands and interests of today? No, no, I agree. It doesn't. It's great for what it was though, in what it did. And that was one, it took gaming out of this kind of, um, kind of periphery of something that, that people did as a leisure activity and brought it into um, into mainstream households. And it really was that first exposure to it. Now, obviously, one of the byproducts was that, you know, at least in, in the US, it, it, it in turn kind of made people think of board gaming as a kid's game and a kid's activity. Um, and we're still to this day kind of trying to get out from underneath that that ideology. And you see that changing. And obviously, people who are having you know, kids of their own now, and they're raising kids with different games, and they're exposed to other things. You know, obviously, the I think the light of Monopoly will wane uh, over time, I and mean, it's it's already well underway. But uh, it, it's hard to escape just just how influential it, it really was for for decades. You know, and in addition to that, it also did include, if you play it right, anyway, a lot of mechanics that we still use. Like it's it's one of the like first real 
auction games in, in board gaming. It also is an economic game. It is a, a game where, you know, there is some amount of trading and negotiation. All of these are still things that we do with games to this day. And so, you know, while the individual, while the, the whole picture, the whole complete, you know, pay, you know the, whole, the whole complete experience of Monopoly may be wanting by uh, by the 2021 standards, uh, I just felt it was remiss that to, to kind of just ignore it because we have moved on in a lot of ways from it. But we, we wouldn't be here without Monopoly. And so, I, you know, I have to give it its praise where it's due. Like I said before, I literally just posted the results, but I'm curious if you peeked at them or not. I, I haven't. I, I Would you like am... to take a stab at guessing? So I will say there were three games that had four votes and seven more that had three votes. So it actually made a really clean top ten. I'm curious if you have any guesses about what those might be. I would like to think that Pandemic is going to be one of them. It's not. It's not. Okay. I believe uh, I believe Pandemic only got one mention and Pandemic Legacy Season 1 got one mention. Okay. That was, well, that that's was actually that, a big surprise to me. Yeah, I mean I I was uh I was considering that one myself. Um I ended up going with a with a slightly earlier co-op game for for different reasons, but that one has become such a mainstay of of kind of lightweight and and co-op style gaming. It's it's almost you know when people describe a lot of co-ops nowadays, they're like, well, it's pandemic style co-op. Like it's become that ubiquitous for a lot of people. So that that was that was me taking a stab at uh, <laughs> at, at what one of them might have been. Um, I am I'm admittedly not good at gauging what other people pick. <laughs> I don't always have the pulse on what people think is the most popular and that is completely irrespective of board gaming. Um, so I, I may have to defer on trying to figure out what they are. Yeah. So the top three are super interesting to me. So uh, the three games, that got four votes. The first one is go, uh, which I was kind of rooting for internally, uh, either go or chess. I, th I think one of those two deserves to be highlighted. Uh, and chess actually had three mentions, so both of them made the top ten. Uh, ah, yeah, I, I did include chess. Yeah, you included chess. And then the other two are Scythe and Terraforming Mars, mm, uh, okay. which uh, surprised me a little bit. But you know, they are newer games, and you know, you, like I said, you I think you submit a, one of the most historically focused lists, and there were certainly a couple people who. Uh, submitted quite recent lists but most people i think kind of were in between um but those two kind of coalesce into two of the two of the most mentioned the other ones rounding out the top 10 are uh everdell uh which which i i was actually surprised by that's one of the few on the one of the only one on the top 10 i haven't played uh everdell gloomhaven netrunner dominion carcassonne magic and chess were the other seven yeah, and that's one of again. This goes back to the appeal and interest around this idea of what what is you know what is to your estimation the greatest game, and um, you know obviously there's you know there is no real wrong answer, right? And so oh yeah, I mean it that's is, it like is, an entire premise of this project, right? The whole premise is that you you leave the question undefined. Um, and, and I think that's what makes it interesting because you're not trying to make like the list. You're trying to get a number of interesting responses and perspectives. I guess Scythe and Terraforming Mars don't really surprise me all that much. They are um, they've both been around for a long enough period of time now, about five years or so, mm -hmm. where they've kind of gotten past that initial, con you know, that that initial you know, beyond beyond kind of that initial hype and has really kind of entered that that category of kind of a lasting uh well liked game like a, like a not, i don't want to call it classic yet but it's it's in that kind of lexicon of like it's it's definitely proven itself as a viable appealing you know replayable game over and over again mm -hmm. um and so I, i'm not i'm not shocked that those are in there i enjoy both of them myself um but the fact that you that both of them made the top three, um, I guess, would would surprise me a little bit. Um, it's also I find fascinating that, that people did 
also include Go um, in an, in the top as a number one, or at least tied for a number one, which is which is really cool to see because I think in a lot of ways Go is uh, underrated and is also fascinating when when you do contrast it with with chess. And I won't go down that whole road, but like just in terms of how it's been around for a much longer period of time, but it's only really been in the last like hundred years where it's really starting to actually gain like a wide scale appeal outside of China. Yeah, I, I'm really happy both of those made the top 10 uh, just because it's like, it's really cool that, you know, chess, what originally started, did it, did it originally begin in the East and then kind of transport West? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was in orig- India. India. That, uh, yeah. It was uh, originally called Chaturanga, I think it was. And then made its way west through Persia and southern Europe and then into Europe. And um, then I think the French got hold of it. It's French or Spanish. And then it kind of became, again, around the 1500s, what we think of chess as now. But if you go back and you look at like the board for Chaturanga, which is uh, like around like 600 AD, it's not that different from how we think of chess now. So it's um, it has had clearly a lasting and, and cross-cultural appeal, which, again, I was one of the reasons I included it because it's... I find that particularly part of it fascinating and just how how games spread over not just decades but across you know over centuries like mm-hmm. that's to me that that is part of the, like the you know part of the process of, of of like cultural spread it is just fascinating to me yeah it, and you know even though chess began in India it's kind of known as a western game and then go is like the counterpart in the east and so i i like that both were were included i was a little bit curious if something like mahjong was going to be included but no one listed that uh, or any other like just like purely eastern games yeah well you would have liked my one of my earlier stabs at this then because it was <laughs> It it was really, I mean, if, again, if I said earlier, like if I really like focus specifically just on, you know, purely historical relevant games in terms of a lifespan, it was, it was pretty much all <laughs> old games like that mm-hmm. with, you know, and with Mahjong and, and Backgammon, and Backgammon was one that I, I weighed for a while, but I mean, at the end I said, well, um, that's largely an abstract and there's been abstract games for millennia. Um, mm-hmm. It's just that that one has also persisted for quite some time. Yeah. And so on. Yeah. Anyways, there's there's the top 10. Thank you so much, Ryan, for coming on and discussing this uh, with me. I think your approach was really, really cool. It's it's obvious you put a lot of thought into it. And I think it's your list, like just looking at your individual list. It's so like well balanced. (laughs) Right. It's got it's got it's got everything. It's got, uh, you know, the big, big names you would expect. It's got you know, an old abstract with chess. You got a party game with werewolf. Uh, you've got Monopoly. You've got um, 1830, which is a super cool inclusion. You've got uh, Arkham Horror. I, I assume representing like a merit, like modern Ameritrash uh, sort of gaming. Modern Ameritrash, uh, you know, kind of that rise of the you know the big box thematic mm-hmm. game, but yeah, but yeah. also the the uh, the original. The original version, the Chaosium Arkham Horror, not quite. I mean, eventually became the Fantasy Flight one that we all think of now. But um, it actually has it. It has a claim to fame because it, it boasts that it was actually the first co-op game. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, even though I was, I, I was again for my purposes, I was actually originally thinking closer to um, Nizia's like Lord of the Rings. That's uh, the one co-op. I always hear mentioned as the as the first one. Yeah, it was it was probably the first one that had kind of again had more of a widespread um, publication appeal because um, when we think of Arkham Horror, we tend to think of the second edition, which is mm-hmm. the 2005 Fantasy Flight version, not the original uh, first edition, which was from the the 80s and didn't have nearly the same level of um, um, of, uh, of of distribution. So, but I ended up when I so my inclusion is definitely based on the second edition. <laughs> but yeah, they they still. Um, they still like to say that Arkham is actually the first real, the first real stab at a co-op. But yeah, also just the fact that it really launched a lot of, um, you know, thematic Ameritrash games, is, is uh, as you put it. And we haven't looked back, and that's go- that's okay too, because like that, oh, yeah. that's a big part of of gaming now. I mean, again, something like Gloomhaven wouldn't be there if we didn't prove that like 
that 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 big kind of splashy games had a lasting appeal. Absolutely, for sure. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. In, in turn, I, again, I say you know thanks for putting this together. This was really kind of a great thought exercise and. Um, you know, after this, I'm going to go and see what, what some of the other people put up and, and, you know, kind of do a little bit of comparison because it's, it's a really, it's a really neat idea. And, and I'm really curious to see how other people approached it. Mm-hmm. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, a fun game I'm, I'm starting to work on is what is the best list I can make that doesn't include any games that anyone mentioned? <laughs> Finally, the last person I speak with is Andrew Holmes who writes primarily for the Meeple Mountain at MeepleMountain.com. His selections are Go, Backgammon, Liar's Dice, Scrabble, Risk, Scotland Yard, Dominion, Carcassonne, Gloomhaven, and Whist. I think I had two things. Games that have, I don't think they need to have been old, but I didn't feel like you can, I could really call a game released in the last year or so the greatest. Yeah. Uh, just because... Uh, where, where's the evidence in that almost? Mm-hmm. And that that sounds really, really harsh on the latest games because, like you said in, in the article, it's are we at a pinnacle of great game design? And, and arguably, the games that are coming out now are way better than the games that were created 10, 15, 50 years ago. In the, for, for the most part, in terms of just just in terms of game design, but but what makes a game great is more than a game that becomes more than itself. I was thinking about this this earlier when I was doing the kids washing up, and why I chose Carcassonne, for instance. And, and I, I love Carcassonne. I, I wrote a, a history of the last twenty years of Carcassonne earlier this year about it that went on for for far too long. And and why for me is is Carcassonne amazing? Well, it, yeah, well, like one of the first games I played. Getting into the hobby, so there is that sort of sentimental value, but it's. It's that there's a culture around Carcassonne that has grown up over the last 20 years that until you start really looking into it, you wouldn't necessarily be aware of, but it, it's just, it's spilled out of the game itself and beyond the, the confines of the game. Like there's, there's an expansion that I keep clicking on, like at least once a month on eBay, it's the um, Game Quarterly expansion. It was released in like 2001, 2003, I can't, I can't remember. And it's just 12 Carcassonne tiles, nothing... Nothing special, just more like the base game. Um, and the only reason I'm that interested in it is because it's not because I'm a collectionist. I, I have I have a lot of Carcassonne expansions, but it's <laughs> it's not because I have to have everything. It's because the history of Carcassonne is that originally when um, Klaus Jürgen Red and I cannot pronounce his name properly, so I'm, many apologies to him. But when he originally designed it, he didn't have monasteries in the, the game. Interesting. And instead, he, he just had some empty fields. Um, and there were tiles that were just nothing but field. And that didn't make it over into the game itself. They uh, uh, When he was going through the, the design process with the publishers, they were like, well, this is it's quite boring to get just a tile that has a field on it. Let's do something more interesting. Um, and that absolutely makes sense. And that's a decision that completely makes sense. But I keep looking at this expansion because it is pretty much the only expansion that just has a tile that is just a field and i want that tile and it's ridiculously expensive i, I mean i say ridiculously it's, it's like 40 pounds i guess 45 dollars maybe mm-hmm. um for 12 tiles that don't do anything and one of which is the only one that i really care that much about <laughs> which is just a field and would probably make for a very boring turn but it's part of that that history of Carcassonne. Um, for me, I was thinking about this earlier, and it was like, well, that's that's almost why Carcassonne is a great game because it's it's more than just what comes in the box. It's that whole mythology that comes around it. It's the community that builds around it. It's the the, the Discord server or the the Facebook groups that are specifically devoted to Carcassonne. And it's just, I think, all of the games. And to be fair, I think I don't know for sure, but the majority of the games on the final list have that, mm-hmm. and there are games that you can absolutely say are, are a fantastic game that are being released today, tomorrow, last year, whenever, but they don't they don't quite have that yet. And there are some really, really good games, but they don't have that same devotion that people sometimes 
give to other games that that passion that just goes far beyond just simply enjoying playing a really good game that's interesting Um, yeah because i talked to two others so far for this podcast about their thought process and both of them looked a lot at how the games influenced other games but i like this this line of thought of how much have the games influenced the people who love them right Hmm. how much how much have the have the games like created their own little community uh, around them. That's that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. Uh, yeah, and it's 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 almost how much of the games influenced the hobby as a whole, not just game design within the hobby, but just the wider scope. And so, Magic: The Gathering, for instance, is on the final list. And and I will confess, I have never played Magic: The Gathering, so I cannot comment on how good it is or not. Um, I know a little bit about it. But I also know what its business model is, and I know that at points in its past, the culture around it hasn't exactly been rosy in all the places that it, it could be. And that's not to, to put any shadow on Magic the Gathering as a game or the people who play Magic the Gathering or today's culture around it. But for me, a great game needs to influence the hobby in a in a really positive way. It has to have this positive impact that's really hard to define and measure and for me the the negativity around its business model is why i didn't include it on 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 my list Mm. it needs to have that and i guess the move from collectible card games into living collectible card games whilst both obviously uh, have finances at their heart at least one doesn't have a you, you may or may not get a rare card that may or may not make your fortune or whatever in the random booster pack and that at least is a step forward for me let me ask you about a couple of your individual picks we already talked about carcass i think it's a great pick you have whist on your on your uh list is is that because of an affinity for whist or more because of its importance in being one of the first trick-taking games i think i mean i've played it a a lot uh, mainly with with family and i've played bridge a lot family and and bridge is just it's it's one of those classic games that are just have again have huge cultures around it and it's it's a phenomenal game but it's also sometimes a bit up itself <laughs> um but the idea i was thinking about i need a card game on my list i need because they were all boards and i needed a game that was really predominantly card based because cards can do things that board games can't and, and vice versa and and I was trying to think about, well, what is it going to be? I'd already ruled out Magic because that would be the sort of the main one. I know I've put Dominion on my list as well, so I can't play this well, but let's ignore that for the moment. <laughs> um, and and it was so I was thinking between uh, between Whist and, and Rummy, um, and then I was thinking about well, Rummy is <sighs> my young is very my young is very close to Rummy in many ways, and then is it Rummy Cub? That's oh, the, yeah, yeah. the, the, the Yar winner. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of combines Rummy and My Young. And it's I mean it's the most successful Spiel de Yar winner of all time in terms of pure sales. It's it's a phenomenally well sell sold game. But then do you choose that or do you choose Rummy or do you choose My Young or and and I was thinking about the idea of trick taking and how for me one of the things that card games do that board games I don't think have a an equivalent of um, and there are there are hundreds of trick taking games but it's still as a basic mechanism it's still so popular today you look at the crew you look at Fox in the Forest and you look at some of the latest ones that I haven't yet tried but it's such a popular genre um, and it's also a genre that people sometimes in reviews always seem to have to explain um, yeah, that's it's like this whole like, pocket world. Yeah, yeah. Like some people, it's like, oh yeah, I, I I've been playing this since I was five years old. I've been playing trick taking <laughs> games, and for other people, they have never, they have no clue what it is. It's it's very yeah. interesting. Well, they they know what it is, but they didn't know that that's a technical term for it. And there's a whole genre of games about them. And so when I when I felt that. My card games doing trick taking. I I can't think of a way that, and and I could easily be wrong. Board games really emulate that in the same way, and and I'm sure if somebody properly thinks about it, they will come up with something and prove me prove me 
well out of order, but and to try and then find the archetypal or the the best trick taking game that still stands up. And I, I didn't feel like I could pick Bridge because it's because it's very pompous in many ways, and sometimes about the culture of Bridge, it's quite snobbish. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also I know a lot of age groups play it, but it's also predominantly. You, you, I mean, my mum plays it, and <laughs> you imagine older people playing it. And I wanted a, a, a game that sort of anybody, everybody can play. And Whist for me fell into that category. I bet if I did this in a year's time, that might be one of the ones that I'd then hesitate over again and, and yeah, yeah. would it would make the list or not, I'm not too sure. Like Carcassonne, I think will always make the list. Mm-hmm. Um Wist should do, but I uh, I don't know. I talked to it was yesterday I talked to Ryan Laflamme and he almost picked Wisp but ended up going with the original trick-taking game triumph uh which apparently split like wis split off from it uh and and then became like its whole a whole branch i don't know anyways i learned a lot about the history of trick-taking games from him uh that i hadn't learned before and i never knew i was taught wist only the first time only a couple months ago and i had no clue it was like centuries old i did i had i had no idea i, was, I just assumed it was you know a, kind of a 20th century invention i didn't realize it was one of the first ones the trick taking game i learned growing up was hearts mm. uh from my that, dad and i always assumed that was like the standard that was like the baseline for trick taking <laughs> but not i really. mean hearts is yeah I, I did think about hearts because hearts is, in in a good, way yeah. yeah and it's it for a long time it came on pretty much most microsoft pcs that were sold yeah that was i and, think what what brought that game into uh the public knowledge is, and uh, yeah I, that, and how many of the games chess on your on the list is probably the only other one that sort of had quite such a a long history with being transported onto computers i guess yeah. but yeah i did think about hearts and and that's why it's like what did you go for hearts i i i knew wist wasn't the originator of trick dating but i did not know it's what apparently was, close to and, it. And that's that's the thing about games with the fifty two standard fifty two deck. It's there are so many there are so many different games and they are a lot of them are so they're just small tweaks and variants on each other and finding ones that really stand out as the greatest mm-hmm. is, is is hard, I think. Yeah. Let's talk about the newest game on your list. So there's a lot of games here, you know. Wist is old, Go is obviously very old, Backgammon's the oldest of all, but you also have Gloomhaven with uh, your focus on trying to get significant, significant games from the past uh, on your list of greatest games. What what makes Gloomhaven an inclusion? I thought about Gloomhaven a fair amount, um, and I'll, I'll say that I haven't played big Gloomhaven. I've, got the, I, I've played through the um, uh, Jaws of the Lion mm-hmm. Gloomhaven. Um, and then that fascinating evolution between the original game and then the, the, the supposedly kid-friendly or, or more junior game. Bloomhaven, I put on the list because I, because it became such a phenomenon. The sheer scale and scope of the box to start with and mm-hmm. and the game within that. And the the size of the Kickstarter, and the fact that Gloomhaven got a lot of people who don't play dungeon crawly type games actually playing a dungeon crawler type game. It's you can think about a whole variety of other dungeon crawlers, and you think, oh, they're they're incredibly successful, but they're also quite niche. And yet somehow Gloomhaven, with its enormous footprint, and I mean that, that original Kickstarter was quite was incredibly cheap um but even even now that sort of i guess it's about 100 pounds 100 dollars or so mm. and and yet somehow it persuaded a load of people to drop that amount of money on a game of the sort of the type they would never normally play i th- i think it's just it's i didn't want to exclude modern games and for me of all the modern games that has been the biggest changer to the hobby Mm-hmm. Um, it took. It seemed to take 
the legacy um, aspect, which I didn't I didn't put a legacy game on my list, which felt badish. But then I put risk on my list, risk <laughs> on my list, which then led to let the legacy go. So I felt I, I reassured myself with that. But it, it took that and and seemed to run with that. And the idea that your characters could then retire, and you could then start it just on the scale of campaign and the, the ability to retire your it, it made so many interesting tweaks and changes that instead of just being a continuation of the genre, it almost started its own of of one, I guess, on our two point five, I think it would be. But of all the of the last like five ten years, that for me seemed to seem to sum up how things have changed. Gloomhaven, I, I'm finalizing my own list right now to, <laughs> to put out. Gloomhaven was it's it's not on it, but it is very hard to exclude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it, I think that's something. It's very hard to ignore Gloomhaven for the last yeah. five years. Ever since it's released, it's been incredibly difficult not to be aware of it. Yeah, and Again, you're you're looking at this from a different way than I've thought of it by looking at kind of the impact on the hobby and on the people in the hobby. Because I look at it and I'm like, it doesn't necessarily change game design. To me, Gloomhaven takes a lot of great ideas from a lot of great games and then does an amazing job of editing those all together into a really smart design. So you have little bits of Mage Knight, you have little bits of like, you know, Magic the Gathering style games, you got a little bit of like Descent, uh, you got little bits of all these other games and they're just combined together into into like just a really perfect package. But I don't know if Gloomhaven as a design necessarily does anything super brand new or super influential, but I think you're correct in saying that Gloomhaven as like kind of emblematic of modern a modern board game success right it's like a guy it's what his second design and he decides to go go all in super ambitious makes the right decisions has success on kickstarter and just becomes kind of the face of like gloomhaven becomes what gaming is about for like a year year and a half maybe Right, you can you can kind of mark like before Gloomhaven is all about pandemic legacy, and it's like, oh, here's here's a different take. And the legacy's downplay; that's not much at all. But like, here's here's like the next big milestone. Here's what everyone's going to be talking about now. In that sense, yeah, it, it's super influential. It's for me, yeah. It's just the getting getting people talking about it somehow, and the fact that it all I know not all of it um, is from one person. I know he hasn't done everything about it but it's 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 largely a, a one-man design or one person design yeah. for a lot of it and just the how that i mean where he got the the balls to just go you know second design all in this is what we're doing yeah i have designed usually when you have, yeah usually when you see in any kind of in any kind of creation if you have like a big bold passion project from like someone who's pretty new maybe it's really awesome and interesting, but you expect it to be like really rough around the edges, but Gloomhaven's so polished. (laughs) It's so, it's, it's like, it's the kind of thing you see from companies that have, you know, five people working on the development for the game for, you know, over a year and they're just working on polishing everything, but no, it's it's just Isaac pretty much. Yeah. And, and I mean, Kickstarter is notorious for, campaigns that don't deliver or are very slow or their issues and and somehow even even running that and delivering that seemed to come off yeah fairly polished yeah i wasn't yeah. part of the first kickstarter i get on i got in on the second printing i think and it was yeah it was the breeziest kickstarter experience <laughs> i ordered it it showed up on time and that was about it <laughs> And you say, how did he? How did he do? How did he condense everything that he puts in that box and everything in his head, and, and all the logistics and everything? How did he manage to do that? Yeah, and get it to so so successful, and, so, and get so many people to back him that first time, and so many people with their faith. In. I have no clue how he did it. I, that would it I wouldn't even know where to start on doing something like that. <laughs> no, 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 I don't know. I'm curious about your reaction. I assume you've looked at kind of the the other uh, results in the list and everything. Yes, I'm curious yeah. if anything anything stood out to you. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because people have taken completely different approaches to what is the greatest, and I think that's that's a really good thing. Yes. Um, and when I made my list, I felt quite boring. It's sort of like how can you how can you put a list of greatest games of all time and not put on something along the lines of Go or chess or or something along those lines? And how can you do it and not have Dominion on it? Because the sheer the ripples from Dominion's impact have just been colossal. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these a lot of ones I put on my list aren't necessarily my favourites. If you ask me for a favourite top ten, it would there'd be some overlaps, obviously, and there'd be there are a lot that I, I enjoy every single one on my list. I think they're, they're fantastic games, but they aren't what I necessarily always turn to. And so I felt quite quite dull for putting a lot of the things that I put on my list and then getting to see what other people have, have put on, on their list and how they've approached it has been fascinating. Like looking at like Andy Matthews or Dan Thru or, or, or whoever who's, I mean, somebody's put on a study of Emerald. And or Babylonia, and I mean, I'm surprised Andy Matthews didn't put on Battleship, which is one of his absolute favorites of all time. Um, I love Andy's but, list. His, his is one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so interesting, and and I wish I'd taken. In some ways, I wish I'd taken that approach to the greatest games of all time because that that is interesting. That that's a fascinating. You just want to you want to find out what was going on in his mind as he as he pulled it together, why he chose those ones. And I spoke to him or messaged him yesterday was and he was like i wish i'd written more about my thought process because i've just i've just put a sentence and and it looks really weird that i've chosen all these games that don't necessarily have a context about why i picked and yeah i mean looking at the final list a lot everything on there makes sense mm-hmm. um i there are some there that i wouldn't have put on like i've talked about magic the gathering and i i stand back and say i haven't played it and i can acknowledge that it's undoubtedly a very good game but there are reasons why I didn't want to put it on there. Sure, yeah. I really dislike chess. I think chess and Go do very similar sorts of things. I know that everything's different, but, but remarkably, it's kind of tick the same sort of boxes for me. And chess, I mean, I will admit I am hopeless at both, and oh, that might too. factor into I'm it. so bad at it. <laughs> but chess, for me, is a game that makes me feel miserable. You start off, and you've got all your armies, and it's all downhill from there. Because even if you're winning, you do not have all your armies left at the end. Mm-hmm. Everything is about whittling away what you've got, and even winning feels sour for me. Um, so between chess and go goes, and I do not pretend to be an expert, but the fact that it took longer to program AIs to solve go than it did chess by about twenty years, for me, not solve, but uh, beat the best human players. For me, speaks volumes about the depth of the two games. So I, I can completely understand why chess is on there, but it's uh, it's not not my favorite. I was quite surprised by Android Netrunner. Oh, not that it's not a good game in any way, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I wasn't one that I'd I'd even thought about. But that's 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 the joy of the list is that you've got these different people with their different viewpoints and, and, and considerations and, and seeing that there's just oh, okay yeah i can i can accept i can accept that there it's the life of it and the community that builds up around it completely i can get that looking at the other list i mean scythe makes sense i think now that i think about it like i like scythe like i do i i do like scythe and i know there's a lot of people who do not like scythe but i think for a lot of people scythe is precisely what we were describing gloomhaven as for us right Mm. that's like the defining kickstarter mega success game that's big and ambitious and uh has you know the amazing table presence and in kind of like defines a portion a segment of time i haven't actually for this for this podcast i don't think i talked to anyone who chose scythe but I assume that's it. And yeah, there's a lot of people where that maybe was like the first huge big success game that they got into and and holds that kind of same ground as as we discussed with Gloomhaven. I can I can see that. For me Scythe is so the art on Scythe changed I think the hobby 
and that the uh, for me <laughs> in a good way i mean it, it's just a beautiful game where the art is just that step beyond most of what had come before it in terms of world building and just uh, so i can absolutely see why people have have fallen in love with it mm-hmm. oh, and then it's got under people's skin because i mean the the, the stone Mayer philosophy of beautiful components and 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 games that you can just uh, drool over because they're just so lovely component and art and everything is 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 completely represented by Scythe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and like you say, that that Kickstarter success, the huge, it just blew up. And yeah, I, so I, I can understand it being on the list. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but I, I and I've never actually played it in real life. I've only played it on a, on, on an app. <laughs> um, so I think I'm probably missing plenty. I've enjoyed my app plays of it a, a lot. Yeah, no, I, I think it, I think it's a worthy of the modern era. It's influential and important game. I cut you off a little bit. You were mentioning Everdell. I, I think you're saying is the biggest yeah. surprise. Same here. I haven't played it, and I just kind of like it. it just kind of passed me by. But now I'm like having. I'm like reconsidering. Like, should I go try to play this game? <laughs> uh, yeah, and and I will. I haven't played. I have it on a shelf not too far away from me. It's sort of ready to be played, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to trying it. I've read a lot about it, and it gets there's a lot of people fall in love with it, but there are also people who there are a lot of people who think it's just it's good, but not not phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, for me, of all the games on the final list, Everdell is the poster child of. It's on this list because it is the new latest shiny thing. Yeah. And that's that's in no way meant to slight Everdell at all. And like I said, I've not played it. I cannot judge how good it or not it is. But that for me is the, the I guess, the hotness on the list. I, I would agree with that. And I'm curious because you're, I, I, I'm talk, I've talked to three people uh, for this podcast uh, who explained it. All three uh, had, took a pretty historical perspective on it, on, on their approach to to selecting their games and that to say that i wish someone had had volunteered who, who chose kind of uh what was clearly like here are my top 10 favorite games right? <laughs> um and i want i want to get that perspective on there because i think it's completely valid to say if if you're asked the question what are the 10 greatest games it's like here are what i think are the best games and I think that's what makes that for me is what makes this particular project interesting is that both looking at the question, what are the 10 greatest games and saying, here are what I think the best games are and someone else saying, here are what I think are great games that also have immense like significance to board gaming in both of those perspectives in my mind are completely reasonable. Like you can defend both perspectives on there. And, you know, then we get really interesting picks like Scythe and, and Everdell from that. Uh, no, I absolutely agree with that. I think that's the the joy of going through those, oh, everybody's different answers. Um, yeah. And seeing what they've picked is you, you really get that. And, yeah, the people who've gone for one of their favorite games or the best games, I think, in the last 10 years, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think my way is is right and and final in any way. And I would, I was really tempted to write two lists just to satisfy my best games of all time, of, yeah. of all favorite games list, and then greatest games list. Because there's that, that that slight distinction, but how you draw that distinction is, is entirely subjective. This will be posted on the website by the time the podcast is up. But as of recording, I am working on finalizing. I got my main 10 greatest games list uh, that I'm going to talk about, but I'm also going to try to make the 10 greatest games that weren't mentioned by anyone <laughs> list, which I think is a very fun exercise. I encourage everyone listening, try to find what are the 10 greatest games that no one mentioned. And I bet they're going to be 10 amazing games. <laughs> uh, undoubtedly. Right? I mean, it's any, any list is, is, is picking from a, a catalog of just amazing games. Remember we're, we're so lucky to be living when we live at the moment that there are so many games you've it's not hard to find terrible games 
but it's it's difficult to find games that are just that make you unhappy and it's relatively easy to find games that will genuinely make you really really happy and enjoy the time and then i yeah i wonder how how you can decide what your I mean, the reason why i've never done a top 10 favorite games is cuz how how i would how i'd actually narrow that down would be tricky I find that to be a far easier. I've released now three over the last five years. I think I've released three times a top. I think the first one was top fifty, and then top hundred games. And I find that process to be much simpler than than the top ten greatest games uh, list. Which I <laughs> agonized over last night. Agonized for like an hour. <laughs> was your ten greatest games in any way influenced by? having seen everybody else's lifts and the sort of the combined I list. tried not to let it and that's why I didn't submit mine as like an official one like it's not part of the the aggregate I realized too late I'm like oh if I'm going to include myself it's got to be before I see anyone else's answers by the time I realized that I had already seen other people's answers <laughs> so I just didn't do it I'm just having it be a side thing I tried not to let it influence it maybe it did a little bit there's certainly I certainly have overlaps with with a couple of the the ones that ended up on the top 10. I chose one just to be a bit, well, I guess I'm not spoiling anything. <laughs> I wanted, I, I chose one just to be, just to be, just to make people angry because I wanted an 18xx game on there. And 1830 is kind of the one you pick there because, you know, that's just, that's, that's the most famous one that kind of spawned everything, even though it wasn't the first 18xx game. But I don't actually enjoy 1830 that much. Uh, so I just chose 1862, which is my current favorite, and kind of an oddball in in the genre. But you know, I have I have a good amount of overlap with uh, some of them, and I don't. I I think it would have still overlapped with some of the top picks, even if I had chosen it before. Uh, like I goes on mine. Netrunner is those might be the only two in the top ten uh, that overlapped. But yeah, it, it's an interesting exercise. Well. Thanks for coming on the podcast uh, and sharing your thoughts. They're very, very interesting. I do like your list, even though you say it's boring. I think it's it's one of the most solid lists submitted. Like, how can you you can't argue with any of these? Like, <laughs> I'm looking at it. How do you how do you say any of these don't aren't great? Like, they're they're all significant to the hobby. It's a really good list. That's the thing. I, when I started doing the list, I was like, well, you could come up with categories. You could have party game, war game, eighteen xx game. And you could you could do that, and you could just easily come up with way more than ten categories of game, and just choose what you think is the greatest game in that. And ten is such a confining number. Oh yeah. And so I look at my list and I think, well, I, I don't really have any party games, or I've got Risk on there, but I don't have any miniatures games. I don't have any. It's yeah. It was. It's a tough process to do down to down to 10 but it was a, a really interesting one and, and finding the reasons to justify choices and why i think they should be on and, and not other games even though i mean it, it's um, it doesn't matter to, to anybody else it, it just it became way more important to myself than it, it probably should have been <laughs> that's the fun of it right is that is that the process of coming up with the list is is almost more important is, is probably always more important than the list itself like it's 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 forcing yourself to think in new and interesting ways which i find re really fun no i agree and I'm, I'm very grateful to you for giving us the opportunity well thank you and uh yeah people seem to be enjoying it so I, I'm, I'm definitely going to do it again next year uh we'll do a 2022 installment uh thanks again um for coming on explaining your thoughts very happy to Thanks for listening, everybody. You can find the full results of the Card and Dice poll, including my list, my analysis, some data, and all that good stuff at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Uh, if you enjoy uh, this podcast and want to support it, you can do so at patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast at the place where you get your podcasts. And you can find me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.